The Mind Health 360 show is brought to you by the London Integrative Mental Health Clinic, which provides the full 360 degrees of mental health, diagnosing and treating the root causes to your mental health symptoms. To find out more, or if there's anything in this episode you'd like help with, please find us at integrativementalhealth.com. Let's focus on some specific brain areas that are more affected by that inflammatory process than others. So we have the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that controls emotion and sensitivity. We have the vagus nerve, which with the limbic system regulates and monitors our perception of safety. Um, whether we feel safe in our body or safe in our environment and the vast majority of our patients with mold toxicity don't feel safe in their environment or in the world many of them have developed extreme sensitivities chemicals food light sound touch emf Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Dr. Jill Krista and Dr. Neil Nathan, thank you so much for being here on the Mind Health 360 show. Very grateful to have you both. Dr. Neil Nathan and I already did a wonderful interview on Lyme and mold a few months ago, actually, which was very well received. And Dr. Jill, first time I have you on the show, and I'm very, very happy to have you here. So Dr. Neil Nathan has been practicing medicine for 48 years and has been board certified in family practice and pain management and is a founding diplomate of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine and a founding diplomate of ISEAI. He's written several books, including Healing is Possible, New Hope for Chronic Fatigue, Fibromyalgia, Persistent Pain, and Other Chronic Illnesses, and On Hope and Healing for Those Who Have Fallen Through the Medical Cracks. His current medical practice is in Redwood Valley Clinic in Northern California, and he can be contacted uh, through his website, neilnathanmd.com. It is worth saying that he has been treating chronic complex medical illnesses for 25 years and Lyme disease for the past 15 years. And he is really very well known for specializing in patients who become so sensitive and toxic that they can no longer tolerate their usual treatment. And he's very good at helping them to recover. Dr. Jill Krista is a naturopathic doctor, a best-selling author, and internationally recognized educator on neuroinflammatory conditions such as mold, Lyme, pandas, and pans, and post-concussion syndrome. She is the author of Break the Mold, Five Tools to Conquer Mold and Take Back Your Health, and supports mold sick people through her Mold Canary membership. She also provides online training for medical practitioners wanting to become mold literate. So really grateful to have you both here because I think, you know, when we think of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, insomnia, cognitive decline, poor memory, poor attention, we don't often think of mold. We think maybe of many things, but, but mold is not the first thing that comes to mind. So what I'd love to hear from you both is in your experience, what made you both gravitate? Because obviously, you know, Dr. Neil, you're a family practitioner, Dr. Jill, you're a naturopath, you treat everything. What made you both gravitate towards mold and why has this become such a sort of crucial issue for you in your practices? Jill, why don't you kick it off? Okay. <laughs> well, for me, I ended up uh, starting my practice, which was primary care practice in Southern Wisconsin, which ended up being a Lyme endemic area. I didn't realize that and I didn't know a lot about Lyme disease. Um, but, you know, with, with functional naturopathic medicine, when you identify the cause and you treat the cause, people tend to get better. It's very elegant. And I was having success with the majority of my patients using those principles, except this other group of people, which ended up having chronic Lyme. And so then I became a Lyme specialist. And again, applying the principles of find and treat the cause, people were getting better, except this other group of people that were doing everything right. You know, these are the hardest working patients. When someone comes to a 
a practitioner like us, they know they're going to get homework. They know that, and they're willing, you know, they wouldn't come to us unless they were willing, hopefully. <laughs> and, you know, these hardworking patients have thought, what in the world is going on? What am I missing? And in one of those patients, they found black mold in his home. So stachybotrys. And I, I went to his home and did the whole tour with the inspector. And it was my very first Pandora's box opening of, oh my goodness, this mold thing is so much bigger than an allergy problem. This is so much bigger than what I understood. And when I hit the research, I was able to identify mold type symptoms in all of those people that were what I'll call like chronic Lyme long haulers <laughs> and that we just weren't getting to the bottom of it. So that's sort of how I entered the mold world and I'm a digger. So I hit all the research and started applying naturopathic principles and sometimes, you know, pharmaceutical antifungals and watching these people turn around as if it were a miracle, but it was because they had done all the homework up to that stand, up to that point, we were able to see really impactful change. It was very, very rewarding. So then you become the mold lady, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, apparently I'm the mold guy. Yeah. So. I think we'll make a good team here, Jill. Um, my entry into the mold world, somewhat similar. I was considered by many people at this point in my career an expert on chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and Lyme and was having, like Jill, a large number of patients who did everything I asked them to do and they weren't getting better. And one day, a, uh, a woman came into my office and she plunked a book called Mold Warriors by Richie Shoemaker on my desk and she said, read this. And I have a stack of books always on my desk that I'm reading. So I stuck it on top of the stack and said, okay, I'll get to it. She said, no, you don't really understand. I am paying you at this visit for you to sit down and read this book now great if people will actually pay me to read this is a great way to earn a living i can i can get get behind this fortunately the heart of shoemaker's book began early on in the book where he described uh, what he called the biotoxin pathway and i read the biotoxin pathway and i went ah this guy is brilliant he has he has found answers that i've been looking for for a long time i literally called his office from my office that day and said you have some time can i fly out and see you can i study with you and richie who is a bit of a character looked at me suspiciously over the phone and said who are you and why do you want to come out and visit with me i said cuz i'm reading your book and it's brilliant and i want to study with you and so he was okay with that. I, I, the next weekend, I literally flew out to Pocomoke, Maryland, which is on the eastern seaboard. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, I spent time with him and we became friends. And I learned his method. And that evolved into my recognition at the amazing number of people with mold toxicity that weren't getting diagnosed, that no one had any idea what to do with, and that, like Jill, I plunged into my research and my reading, and that's evolved into my understanding of, of mold toxicity. So once the light bulb turned on and one recognizes this is not rare, and in, in the United States, it's estimated that as many as 10 million people are currently suffering with mold toxicity. And so not rare. And Kiki in the UK, having quite a few UK patients um, in the wet, damp, old buildings, mold is very prevalent. So um, it's something that we really need to be honoring and looking at and treating because we can. So in terms of mental health, how do you, what are the symptoms, what are the ways that mold can impact our mental health? And what are the sort of symptoms that you associate with it? And also, what is the mechanism of how mold can impact our mental health? Again, Jill, why don't you start? We'll tag team here. Sure. All right. Well, mechanism might be the easiest place to start because it does help explain some of the symptoms. It causes a lot of inflammation. So we know that systemic inflammation expresses in the brain. 
Um, we have this idea that the blood brain barrier, you know, has this big wall and nothing can get past, but that just isn't the case. Some of these mycotoxins can cross the blood brain barrier and impact the brain in that way, inducing mast cells, inducing the immune system of the, of the brain. We see that it can change how macrophages do their munching and eating of toxins. So it alters all of these systems that we have in place. And then there's a lot of gut breakdown, which we know the gut, gut brain barrier can happen. So when we can actually get a leaky brain, so things can get into the brain tissue that otherwise with a healthy gut or a healthy blood brain barrier wouldn't be able to get in there. So we have many, many impacts that are happening at one time. And so I think the, the number one thing that I'm seeing is anxiousness as far as a mental health symptom. And I'd love to hear if Neil's seeing this, you know, what, what level, but I'm careful not to say anxiety because I think that people have an idea of anxiety being anxiety disorder, something I need medication for. And that's just not really, while that can happen, the majority of the anxiousness that I'm seeing is a, it's more of an inner sense of unrest. Something's not okay. I'm not okay. My world is not safe. And, and it can also kind of create a belief system of that, that you come into the world now with the world is a dangerous place. I don't know, Neil, did you want to Sure, I can expand on that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so number one, that's absolutely correct. Inflammation is the key. And, and let's focus on some specific brain areas that are more affected by that inflammatory process than others. So we have the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that controls emotion and sensitivity. We have the vagus nerve, which with the limbic system regulates and monitors our perception of safety. Um, whether we feel safe in our body or safe in our environment. And the vast majority of our patients with mold toxicity don't feel safe in their environment or in the world. Many of them have developed extreme sensitivities, chemicals, food, light, sound, touch, EMF, every type of sensitivity imaginable, that makes them even more concerned about the safety in their environment because stimuli that don't affect their neighbors or friends or family really affect them powerfully so that leaves them unable to function. When we add to that the vagal nerve dysfunction, which controls the entire autonomic nervous system. It controls intestinal motility, which ties into the gut-brain axis duality. It ties into um, our ability to function either in fight or flight or shutdown mode by the way we react to these stressors. So that between these two areas, the vagus nerve and the limbic system, this creates an extreme sensitivity on the part of our patients in which their, their brain, this is not psychological, this is neurological, their brain literally goes, I'm not sure that what you're doing is safe, and so I'm not going to let you do it. And so we need to address those issues early on in treatment because they may not be able to take the substances that we need to give them to treat the mold successfully. And as you correctly point out, the mast cell um, activation process adds another level of inflammation to an already inflamed system here. So what I see, as you, as you do, Jill, extreme anxiety to the point of panic, severe depression, OCD behavior, and severe cognitive impairment, particularly difficulty with word finding, cognitive functions like executive functions, um, using words and numbers, uh, being able to focus, what we call brain fatigue, where someone who used to be able to multitask can't anymore. Now they don't even trust that they are correctly doing what they have known how to do their whole life. And these are extremely common with mold toxicity. I would say that the vast majority of my patients have some component of that. It's, it's rare when they don't. 
fascinating because I was reading in Jill's book, which is something I'd never heard, is that Dale Bredesen, who is the sort of Alzheimer's guy, talks of mold toxicity in the form of in inhalation Alzheimer's. And that basically, you know, he, he talks of a category of Alzheimer's, which isn't true Alzheimer's, which is mold toxicity, which manifests as Alzheimer's symptoms such as loss of words and loss of memory, et cetera. And I found that fascinating. But how, so there are a couple of lead on questions for, from that. The first one is how does this work? I mean, how does the actual, if you can explain to us the difference between mold, mold spores, mycotoxins, I think that would be helpful because I know there's uh, quite a difference there. And so people might not be familiar with that. And second of all, how do these mold spores or mycotoxins cause that inflammation? That is such a great question because I think that when you look at the CDC's definition of mold related illness, they will define it as basically spore related interactions with the body. So that's going to be things like um, sinusitis, asthma, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. And then the, there's like no in between you go from that to aspergillosis of the lungs. So, you know, the way that I see it is a much broader continuum. I know Neil as well, much broader continuum by looking at all the other ways that mold can harm a body. So just on the spore story, there are spore fragments after mold dries and dies it can break off these little friable fragments in a form of 500 to one. So 500 fragments to one spore. And these little fragments are ultra fine particulate. So in, they're in the PM 2.5 environmental um, respirable toxin category. They can kind of irritate the body like asbestos does. So they get into the lung tissue. They can stay ever suspended in the lungs. Um, even a jogger, you know, of, a, of breathing in and out really rapidly, you get this little spinner in the lung that just stays there. And so it can create this persistent irritation, agitation, and affect the surfactant and the mucosal linings of the respiratory tissue. So that's the spore stuff. And then there are toxins or chemicals that happily living mold will secrete. This is things like mycophenolic acid, aldehydes, alcohols. I kind of a joke, I'm like, breathe moldy air, get drunk, you know, because you can, when you're breathing them in, your body has to take them in and deal with it. Uh, microbial VOCs, and that's when we see people get really chemically sensitive. Things, these are the types of things that can go through building material, even if the spores are locked behind that building material, and you don't have any interaction with the spore or the fragment, you can be getting mycochemicals, so to speak. So the, I call them mold farts in my book, just kind of trying <laughs> to, like, <laughs> you know, just happily living, metabolizing mold, and it's just off-gassing these things. But then there's a whole other component called mycotoxins that are made by mold that wants to be competing for its territory. So it starts to try to gas bomb out other living things. And the intention of mycotoxins is to harm other living things. We're not the target, but we get hit in the crossfire. And these are very ultrafine chemicals as well. So they can come through building materials such as flooring, roofing, drywall. It comes right through those materials because it's ultra small they attach on to ultra fine particulate and dust and things in our air. And now that becomes an, an aeratable toxin. And that goes right into our bloodstream through our respiratory mucosa, through the lung tissue, the alveoli, which are the smallest parts of our lungs. And that gets into our bloodstream. And now we have a toxin problem. And it can, those toxins can affect our own flora just by interacting with those toxins. Our own flora will start to defend its territory because if you think about the intention in the toxin is the message is I'm coming to invade you. And so our own flora goes from being a happy sinus biome or microbiome into a defensive status. And you add some vagus nerve <laughs> problems in there where someone's in fight or flight or freeze mode. Now you have, you know, your inner microbial messaging is this system is under threat. And so it behaves completely differently. Okay. Did I hit it all, Neil? <laughs> I, I think you're doing great. I, I think the, the take home message is we inhale it. Um, and it, it's, as Jill is telling us, it's an inflammatory soup that we're inhaling. It isn't just a spore, 
It's the spore, the fragments, the mycotoxins, the VOCs. There's a whole bunch of protein rich materials. There's a bacterial species called uh, actinomyces. And this, what we call mold, is really this inflammatory soup. And all components of it have an inflammatory effect on the body. And teasing it apart isn't helpful. Calling it mold toxicity is really the right way to look at it because it's a, that's, that's really what's happening here. It's a complete thing. And then, I mean, it's interesting what Jill was saying about how our own microflora sees it as a threat and then starts to compete with it. And so it creates, so the, in terms of the inflammation, is it our body that actually starts to produce inflammatory chemicals to fight off the mold toxins? Is that how it works? Um, yes. And, um, cause it's more complicated than that. The, the nature of mold toxins, I'm going to just talk about the mycotoxins because we can measure them most easily. We, a simple urine test can give us the information we need on mycotoxins. Um, they, and this was what I originally studied with Dr. Shoemaker in his first book, Mold Warriors, he put together this very clear step-by-step -step process by which the mycotoxin binds in fat cells to specific receptors, which triggers reactions, which in, in turn in the brain shuts down leptin chemistry, shuts down VIP chemistry, and there's this domino effect of in which the pituitary gland is no longer functioning properly, our hormones aren't functioning properly, our gut is affected, our pain receptors are affected, we tend to have more pain than we did before. The, it, it leads to a persistent inflammatory reaction that we are losing the ability to shut down. And as long as those toxins stay in us, they continue to fire up this inflammatory process that unless we shut it down, we are going to be abjectly miserable for a long period of time. It's very interesting. And the other thing that's interesting is, you know, when you were talking about feelings of safety and, you know, how sort of this mold toxicity makes us feel unsafe, it reminded me a lot of sort of the, the you know, trauma and ner nervous system responses. And I think, you know, what, what I find complicated as a sort of patient slash lay person is, and I'm sure what you guys probably find complicated as well, is how do you isolate what is causing this? Because the, the mechanisms are similar depending on the root cause. So it could be childhood trauma. It could be, you know, heavy metal poisoning. It could be Lyme disease or certain other infections. How do you isolate mold and say, you know, okay, well, we know it could be all those things, but as practitioners, how do you narrow it down and say, okay, this is mold? Fantastic question. Uh, such a difficult question, actually, that I had to create a questionnaire for myself in practice because I was having a very difficult time determining that very question. Uh, Dr. Horowitz has created the Lyme MSIDS questionnaire and that I used that as sort of an inspiration. So I was using that every day and it still wasn't pulling out or teasing out who of those chronic Lyme patients also had mold. And so there are some things that are, are different about Lyme disease than are about mold, but they look so similar. The Venn diagram of both of these conditions is so similar that they could both be considered great imitators. You know what, I, my experience of mold is that whatever your genetic and nutritional, whatever your Achilles heel is, it's just going to aggravate that. So every person displays those symptoms a little bit differently. And I would say it's more the rule than the exception that every person in the home is going to have a slightly different expression of that mold related illness or mold related exposure. And I, I'm not sure, Neil, are you seeing that same thing that everybody is I, I am, and I would answer Kiki's question um, a little bit differently, which is all the things you mentioned are profoundly interrelated. So your childhood experiences set 
your limbic system and vagus nerve and perception of safety at a certain area. And with each succeeding stressor or experience, it makes you more and more vulnerable to being affected by the stimuli that are going through you. So what you experience in childhood or later years um, profoundly affects whether or not you're going to get mold toxicity or Lyme disease because they affect your immune system. It affects the vulnerability of your immune system. So when you ask, how do you sort it out? It's usually not one thing or another. It's usually and. And then it is the skill of the practitioner to orchestrate what is my patient's comfort level with how I approach this. In general, even if patients have had a significant amount of therapy in their life, their general approach is that they would prefer it, the issues to be on the physical plane. So I usually start with the physical plane because that's usually the place of greatest comfort for my patient. And the physical plane will usually mean the patient has a toxin like mold. But although we're talking about mold with some exclusivity, keep in mind that when we talk about toxins, we really need to be talking about what we call toxic load, which is the cumulative accumulation of toxins to which we are all exposed until it reaches a critical threshold at which point the body can no longer function at a normal level anymore. So you may go on for years with toxic exposures and do okay until something happens. That could be a stress. That could be surgery or childbirth or a uh, loss of a very uh, important person to you or um, any of those things. Or it could be a, a significant exposure to mold or a tick bite in which you get exposed to a wide variety of infectious illnesses, not just Lyme, but the co-infections that go along with Lyme. And so, Everything is causing everything else here. The mold toxicity weakens the immune system and predisposes to Lyme. Lyme weakens the immune system and predisposes to mold. And stress predisposes to everything. <laughs> Sorry, not something I want to laugh about, but um, that's the reality that we're working with. So your question, Kiki, is excellent. And it, it is the skill of the practitioner to tease these apart, keeping in mind the comfort level of the patient as to what you do first. There is no algorithm that works. You can't just plug into, okay, you've got this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this. Um, you can do that. And for many patients, you won't be working at the level that they want you to. You have to be meeting that patient where their perceptions and needs are. Yes, we can impact that, but we've got to include what they think is important. So for many of my patients, later in treatment, we're going to need to get back into going over childhood trauma and work on that. That's going to become important. Not on day one. On day one, what these ill patients want to hear is, ah, I know what you have and I know how to treat it. So let's get started. I think that's really true. And I was talking to a patient the other day, in fact, who was a lady who came to me and uh, she was very interested in the genetics of mental health issues and the nutritional factors and all, all that. And it was only after a while of speaking to her that it became clear that she had a lot of childhood trauma, that it was a lot easier for her to focus on the biochemistry. And I think for all of us, it is in some sense easier. And that's one of the things I love about functional medicine and integrative psychiatry is that 
you can really focus on the biochemistry because there are downstream effects of the trauma and the, you know, there are a lot of biochemical effects. And equally, what, what's interesting is that, you know, in some ways, I suppose you could just have mold poisoning, but then that makes you susceptible to everything else on top of it. So you're right. I mean, one has to be with a very skilled practitioner. I know you guys are doing a course, in fact, in April to train practitioners and healthcare practitioners in terms of treating mold and diagnosing it and, and treating it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that course? Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start and Jill, you can chime in. Um, so um, a few months ago, Jill and I realized that we had between us a lot of very valuable information. In, in um, Often in my teaching, um, I teach mostly to medical audiences and I have a particular way of looking at it. And I had the opportunity to listen to Jill give a bunch of lectures and I realized she has other pieces of this that I think are very important. So I thought that a more comprehensive approach would be very, very helpful for uh, healthcare professionals so that they didn't get the idea that there was a way to do this, that there were many ways to do this, that they, if they, Simplistically, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more uh, problems that you can solve. I mean, that's really kind of what it boils down to. So we decided to put on a, a joint workshop, which we're going to be doing April 24th and 25th. Um, it's going to be a live Zoom meeting. Um, it will be taped, but I'm really going to encourage people to hear it live. The people who do participate in it, we have kind of a bigger vision than that. We, we were hoping to have every three months afterwards, a three or four hour um, follow up in which the attendees would present their cases and Jill and I would separately go over those cases so you would get two different perspectives on how to look at it, how to work it up, how to treat it, how to manage it. Um, and that would be ongoing. In a sense, um, I know both Jill and I do mentoring programs already. I can't handle all the requests for mentorship I've got. And so this would be a way for us to get a larger audience particularly in Europe. Um, both of us do a lot of consultation and we have realized, and I know Kiki, you know this is the case, that in Europe, there is not a lot of appreciation of either mold or Lyme. And it's critical that we begin to educate practitioners about how big this is and how important it is so that um, the entire European population can begin to get better treatment. So that was the motivation. And this is going to be a two-day program. And we're both going to be lecturing different aspects of it. Um, it's a practical very comprehensive overview of mold, meaning not only what it is, but how to diagnose it, how to treat it, and how to treat mast cell activation, limbic dysfunction, vagal nerve dysfunction, um, detoxification in general. And so we hope that at the end of this two-day period, practitioners will be much more comfortable with, ah, okay, that's what I knew to make the diagnosis. This is how I can start treatment. And then we hope to continue their education on an ongoing basis so that we can make um, the European uh, providers more comfortable. So yeah. that was long-winded. Jill, why don't you uh, add to that? Oh, I actually have more to add. That was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. And we'll put all the details in the show notes. So it'll be accessible to people and in our social media, et cetera, because I think it's really important. And in terms of the ratio, the numbers, obviously, probably because you guys are known as the mold lady and the mold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The amount of people coming to you for mold. But would you say sort of... Are you able to ascertain what proportion you would think of sort of normal patients might have mold issues? Might be hard given your speciality, but. That is, that is difficult because uh, I, I went from primary care practice to Lyme. 
So already that, that changed my perspective on the world. And, you know, you go through a phase where you have line goggles on, and then I went through a phase where I had mold goggles on. I, I hope that my goggles are starting to settle out now, but I would guess that in my complex chronic disease patients, I think they're riding it somewhere between 35 to 50% is somewhere related to mold toxin illness, mold exposure. So I'll answer that question um, from several perspectives. Um, when I was a family physician, which I was for a very long time, um, I didn't make those diagnoses because I'd never heard of them when I was starting my medical practice. Um, as I became more involved and I, I became interested in and therefore was referred patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And I, that became a huge part of my practice. I was able to help those patients in much more simplistic ways by recognizing that they were had issues with the adrenal, thyroid, sex hormones, magnesium deficiency. And over the years, I began to notice that those treatments helped a lot of my patients, but not all. And I began to realize, oh my goodness, Lyme disease is out there and I've got to learn more about that. So I learned more about that, like Jill, and I became a Lyme expert. And so I was a Lyme expert with an interest in chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And then I learned about mold. And so at this point, my patients all have mold and Lyme. So uh, not a fair question. When I reflect back, maybe I'm going to look back about 15 years ago before I was treating mold. Um, in retrospect, there were more of those in my practice than I realized. Looking back on it, I know I missed that diagnosis in a number of patients. And uh, so what I can tell any practitioner is that uh, you are seeing mold right now, whether you know it or not. And so you do want to learn the symptoms and presentation, and you want to begin to ask a question that I never did before. Have, are you living in a moldy home? Have you seen mold? Do you smell it? If you're not living in a moldy home now, did you before? Um, did you live in a basement? And it's really interesting. Patients will immediately say, nah, 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 I, I, nah I've never lived in a moldy environment. And but once that question bounces around in their head a little bit, when they come back for the second visit, they will give me a little list of, well, when I was a child, I lived in a moldy basement. And then we moved to this house where I know that there was black mold on the wall of this particular building. And it, it, it's almost universal. So it's consciousness. Absolutely, which is super important. And then finally, before we wrap up, I just wanted to know a little bit about how you treat it. So what are sort of the key things, the key steps? Because I think one of the challenges is that, first of all, you can have been, you know, you can have been exposed to mold in the past, and then you can still carry it with you to the next place, even though there's no mold in the next place. And so how do you deal with that? And how do you get rid of it? And then the second question is, even if you get rid of the mold, you can still have sort of cell danger response. You can still have an inflammatory reaction that persists post mold, you know, once you've gotten rid of it. So how do you deal with that? Well, um, there's a two day lecture coming up. On <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the easiest number one thing to say and the hardest to do for a lot of patients is avoidance. You know, we've seen occupational studies when you take people out of that moldy exposure and granted they're not moving their stuff with them or that kind of thing, half the people walk away completely fine. And so I think that's the hopeful message is that, you know, not everybody has to have this long story that you might get on mold Facebook groups and, and hear every horrible story. So to be on that, you know, that side of the coin flip, that is, a, there are a lot of things that determine that all of those things are what we use then from there on, which is optimizing their nutrition, helping with the detoxification, reducing the immune activation, mod modulating the immune system, 
And for me, I, I put a lot of focus on the fact that these are lipophilic. If, if the majority of my patients and everybody has their own selection bias based on who's coming to see them, but the majority of my patients are coming with a mycotoxin load that it, they may also have allergy. They may also have issues with, you know, other parts of that mold story, but the majority of them are coming in with quite the load of mycotoxins and I also endotoxins. So I love what Neil was saying is these water damage buildings. I wish we could call it water damage building illness because there are, there's a bacterial load. There are, you know, biting insects that like to feed off mold that then affect the person and transmit infectious disease. So there's all of these things in a, in a water damage building that, that is a bigger story than mold, but mold is really, the mycotoxins are the most, I wanna say the intention being the most dangerous. Um, so for me then remembering that these are fat soluble or lipophilic is the medical term, that means these are able to bioaccumulate and they're getting into tissues that we don't want them in like bone marrow, like brain tissue, nervous system, the, the linings of our organs, the omentum that's guarding our visceral, our visceral um, tissues. So I was trained the solution to pollution is dilution. And that was drilled into my head. <laughs> solution to pollution is dilution. And if it's a fat soluble toxin, we need to dilute that with a lot of good quality fats and a lot of them. And we see this in the autism spectrum diagnoses that a lot of these kids need fat soluble nutrients and good fats. You almost need to flood them with fats. And so not only flooding them, but then helping that fat movement by helping you know, bile movement and detoxification. Um, and then supporting their, if we look at animal studies, what they're doing is rather than feeding animals non-moldy food or feed, which would be one solution to, that would be a little more, um, I don't know, we're, we're weird as humans. What they're doing is they're adding bioflavonoids and they're adding herbs like turmeric to their feed. So if they're doing that to keep the animals alive, I think that we can safely do translational medicine and tell people that there are these specific nutrients and minerals and plants that can help the body detoxify and protect the cells. We see cytotoxicity or cytoprotection, genoprotection, and things that will stop carcinogenic processes, which is really a beautiful thing to be able to do for somebody because this is there's a lot of fear in this world of mold too, that the story is you'll never get better. This is really hard, you know, all of those things. And so I'm hoping that we can take that, you know, through our teaching that we're, we're equipping doctors with the faith that there are things that you can do. And the last thing on my list, and I used to have it as the, the top of my list until I made people worse with it, which is antifungal therapy. I've noticed that people just need their microbiome to be reset and to get back into a, a commensal, happily living, sharing environment where they're sharing nutrients instead of competing for nutrients. That's like my big overview. <laughs> well, that's great. And I have to say in your book, there's a lot of information about the specific nutrients and that's really helpful. So, and I'm sure in your two day course, it's going to be, there's going to be some amazing stuff. Um, and then Neil. Well, to answer your question, I'm going to do it a little differently, which is I break down mold treatment into three major categories. Number one, you have to um, assess the patient's environment at home and at work to be sure they're not in a moldy environment. If they are in a moldy environment, they cannot get well until they fix the environment or move. It's non-negotiable. And as Jill alluded to, very tricky, very difficult. There are all kinds of social reasons that moving is fraught with not just difficulties. It's uh, people don't have the financial resources to do it. They're already living with their parents and, and so on and so forth. But bottom line is you cannot get well if you stay in a moldy environment. You've got to get out of that environment or fix it, uh, which is doable most of the time. Number two, you need to take the binders, the specific binders, things like charcoal, clay, chlorella, um, Saccharomyces boulardii and others that specifically bind those toxins to pull them out of the body. And thirdly, um, for many people, not all, you need to add an antifungal piece because if 
that patient is growing mold and candida in their sinus or gut areas, which is typically where it grows, they can't really get well until we get it out of there. And by that point, the body can reboot itself. One of the beautiful things about the human body is it's capable of healing if we give it what it needs to, to heal properly. And so um, you had alluded, Kiki, to the cell danger response so that, yes, if there is a prolonged inflammatory process, the key to shutting off the cell danger response is not convincing, but showing the body that what's triggering it is gone. So if the toxin is gone, then the mitochondria, which are the part of the body that monitor the whole cell danger response process can go, ah, it's safe. Now we can move on through the cell danger healing process. And then, um, fixing hormones, getting detoxification to work, taking the correct nutrients. At that point, that kicks in and healing is possible. So if I have one message, it's, or 10 messages, it's mold toxicity is common, needs to be looked at, diagnosed, but here's the big thing, it can be successfully treated. So as awful as people can feel, we can treat it. And that's really the take home message. And they get better. And I mean, I think two things that I just wanted to pick up on. One is, you know, the fact that even if you move from your ward or damaged building, when I was reading Jill's book, I was really upset to see that some of, you know, you, the things that you, your stuffed animals and your clothes and your books, these can contain, you know, the mycotoxins, the mold spores, the dust, et cetera. And if you bring that to your new environment, it can continue to impact you. How big a problem is that? I mean, do you have to sort of burn all your belongings if you, I mean, this is quite traumatic. <laughs> Well, I, um, I'm pretty clear that I'm a body expert, not so much a building expert. Um, but, it, you know, we as doctors, we do have to help our patients navigate these difficult decisions. I do recommend that people and I know that in the UK, it's, um, it's, it's hard to find someone but that specializes in their building, in their environment, their built space, so that they can do some testing and figure out exactly what's going on. Just like Neil said, you, you need to, you know, investigate what's going on with their current living environment. And the question about stuff comes up all of the time. Um, I highly recommend people go to Mold Finders Radio. It's a podcast that goes through all of these things, all of these questions. You know, what about stuff? Um, he has an algorithm as far as, you know, how porous is it to how, how much does it mean to you? Like if it's a really porous thing and you have a lot of attachment to it, maybe it needs to just be stored in plastic off-site somewhere else, you know, while you clean up your environment and you clean up your body. And once we get that cell danger response and that limbic system out of that mode of I'm not safe, and you can really distinguish what's affecting you and what's not, re-engaging that intuition that is having a true reaction from a, I'm going to react to everything reaction, and then interact with that thing later. But, you know, stuff can wait, nothing's going to expire. You know, that stuffed animal isn't going to expire. So it can be stored away and you can make these decisions with professionals who can test. And if you want to use your own body as that test, that's one of the things that I think that we're both very engaged in is getting people that resilience back. You can heal and you can heal and be a better person, a stronger person, and one that trusts your intuition that when you go into a moldy hotel room, you can say, this isn't gonna be good for me, I'm gonna request another room and that's okay. Those kind of things, those kind of self-protection things that really help keep your total toxic load down. Maybe there's, they don't use chemicals on their lawn anymore. Maybe they're not using chemicals for cleaning anymore because this happened. And that's gonna benefit the whole planet if people are more conscious of that. Agreed. And one of the issues, though, when you talk about people coming and testing is that a lot of the time people will come and test and say, well, you know, it's not that bad. They're very low levels here, which happened to a friend of mine. And, you know, yet if you do different types of tests, which is sort of the plates where you grow the, the mold, essentially, which is much more thorough, you get a very different result. And a lot of the landlords are using sort of the more light testing because it's in their interest to say actually this isn't that bad and frankly it doesn't harm 
you. And so there's not enough mainstream um, awareness of the fact that mycotoxins can be so harmful. And as you were saying, it's more of a focus on the mold spores and mold allergies, but that's just a tiny piece of the puzzle or the picture. So it's a challenge. And then the only other thing I wanted to touch on, and I know that you go through a number of different uh, supplements to help detoxification and, and to help support mold, you know, uh, clearance, I guess, sort of binders and things like milk thistle and resveratrol and, and those types of things. And I'm interested in the way you talk about the answer to, to pollution is dilution. And the sort of the fats, the fact that these toxins are fat soluble is fascinating. And so would you say that people who are on like very high fat, but good fats, like lots of olive oil and uh, avocados and nuts and seeds, is that something that we should be doing to help us with mold toxicity? I personally have found that to be really beneficial, especially if brain fog is an issue. You know, if there are a lot of cognitive problems or anxiety, I describe it and it's very much oversimplifying it, but that the fat is coating your nerve. It's making you, less, you know, the way my brain thinks about it. But that's why things like fiber and binders are so important is that you can be putting the fat in, but you really need to be having that, interrupting that exchange of bile I tease that I'm a biophile. I'm so into like bi making bile and getting people's bile moving and binding really what we're doing is we're binding the bile that's been detoxified as well as the other binders that are grabbing things that are unbound to bile. So it's that combination of things. And because a lot of people have endotoxin exposure, that's where some of these things like charcoal and clay can also benefit them because it can grab some of those. So I do see that, you know, the, um, the, the movement of bile has to be happening at the same time as you're dumping in more fats for dilution and movement and grabbing of bile. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, guys, that has been really, really fascinating and has given us just a taste of, you know, you both have some fantastic books. Dr. Neil, your, your book Toxic is fantastic. Dr. Jill, Breaking the Mold is brilliant. So highly recommend those. And then your course on the 25th, 4th and 25th of April, I think is going to be brilliant. So well done for doing that. And, and thank you both so much for your time. Just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to share what we know with you and your audience. And I hope this will be helpful for them. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.